Let's discuss the Godot Steam extension and the high-level networking API. This is all about how to use the two together using high-level networking on Godot, which is a very popular game editor right now and actually has a very flexible support structure behind its multiplayer aspects. Now, multiplayer in Godot on the surface is fairly easy. The HLN API allows multiple programs connected over some form of network, it doesn't assume how they're connecting, to synchronize their data. So that makes it really easy to have a shared experience for many different players, uh, as they virtually seem to be using the same program. This is how many things like Team Fortress, as an example, work. Godot's HLN contains many useful features. RPCs, or remote procedure calls, allow machines to call functions on other peers. Multiplayer authority tracking allows restricting control to specific players. Multiplayer synchronizers ensure that all peers have identical feel fields when you have set it to watch those fields. And multiplayer spawner, a form of synchronizer, I think, ensures that all peers will simultaneously spawn scenes. Somebody throws a water balloon, you want all peers to know that that water balloon scene just entered it. So, Between these, you have basically everything you need for most modern networking games and plenty of extensibility. When publishing a game through Steam, Steam has a service which will make finding other players much easier. Steam's system for networking is a relay meaning it connects different players to the same game via a central matchmaking server. Otherwise, the Steam network is designed to be practically invisible. It's very easy to keep in its own module and to just slip into your code. But first you have to get on Steam. Now, Steam is very open to new game makers. But Valve is a formal business. It requires registration as a partner first. There's plenty of paperwork on that, lots of tax information and the like, plenty of verification that you are not associated with a hostile foreign entity or something like that. And they currently ask for about two weeks of review time, last I checked. Uh, lastly, in order to avoid getting a lot of spam on their platform, they charge $100 US per game released. Even if the game does not make any money or makes significantly less than that, and it's not because they need the hundred. The money goes entirely to children's hospitals. It's an anti-shovelware effort. In other words, it's an attempt to ensure that nobody grabs AI or something, produces 10,000 games, and jams them all on Steam in an attempt to make a quick buck. Um, $100 is not the kind of thing you find lying around in most cases, but for me, it has been reasonable. This is substantially less than the investment that would be required to publish on, say, a PlayStation or other consoles, of course. Those can run into easily thousands of dollars. So I find this to be a nice middle ground and a reach out. You will need to do this first before you can really use the Steamworks API. But once you do, the API is available to all programs running on Steam games and otherwise, and it has a lot of great features. You've got achievements, collectible cards in the workshop if you have something open for modding on it, and most of, importantly, for this at least, multiplayer. But it's chiefly on the C++ level, and I know a lot of people don't know C++, and those of us who do know to do as little of it as possible, <laughs> not be proud of any disrespect, but because of exactly how low it is and how few restraints there are on that. So it can be a reasonable reason to be a little nervous. However, there's a bridge, thankfully. Godot Steam, managed by GP Garcia, aka Gramps, uses the Steamworks API with Godot, and you can get it right off of the asset library. It's particularly easy to use. Rather than dropping to C++, which you can of course do if you want to with Godot, but we're avoiding that, we just use that plugin. 
Once we have the Godot Steam plugin, Steamworks functionality is available to us in GD script and really any other high-level compatible language. Again, Godot Steam is currently available in the Asset Library, which is just a tab in the editor. However, it's not really enough on its own, because while it opens up Godot Steam, there's no bridge to the high-level networking system. That would be Steam Multiplayer Peer. Steam Multiplayer Peer extends something called Multiplayer Peer Extension. It serves as a facade pattern so that once a connection is negotiated over Steam, all players can synchronize on it, just like they were with any alternative like WebSocket or Enet. Now, Steam Multiplayer Peer does depend on Godot Steam for its functionality. I recommend installing Godot Steam first and then Steam Multiplayer Peer just to avoid having to restart or anything screwy. To use Godot Steam, which is important for a multiplayer peer as well. We begin with Steam init or Steam init x in a ready function somewhere, just to register our program with the Steam client. You need a game ID for that, which is what you get for that hundred dollar and approval period. That one belongs to you, but we will be using. Uh, you can use either that if you have one already, or 480 for the Space Wars program for testing. Space Wars is entirely meant for testing. It covers just about every feature other than a few explicable ones, like Workshop, I believe, is an issue. Achievements may also be an issue. Eventually, you will want to move to your provided game ID from Steam. So that's what Steam in it does. You just need to call it once right at the beginning before you use any Steam functions. But each frame, since Steam primarily works with callbacks, trying to keep as little of a footprint as possible, you need to call steam.runCallbacks. I suggest putting it in a process function somewhere, so every single frame that is called. That way, when something happens that catches Steamworks notice, it will inform us. So those two are the essentials. Let's start with something a bit more basic than Steamworks, though. Enet is a Libre, um, effectively Libre, networking client, which you have with virtually every version of Godot, unless you've slimmed it down somehow. As convenient as relay services are, they generally aren't free or Libre. They have to be managed by somebody, and they do cost money to run. Enet is very available, allowing you to run local servers. A local server is something where basically you don't bother with Steam or Epic or anybody else. You just run it on your own machine. It also allows you to run a host and client on the same machine, and I have to say this is particularly valuable, as when we are initially testing these in order to run host and client on Steam, you will need two accounts. I suggest either getting a friend or a family member to help you out with theirs or to buy something cheap on Steam to get your account. The downside to the second one is it will be a limited account for some time. But with port forwarding, you could also run a public server with Enet if you wanted to. You would lose all the other Steamworks features, but that's okay sometimes. And lastly, I want to emphasize that Enet is already included with Godot. We also have WebSocket and WebRTC at this point for the instances where they might be helpful. Now, I want to emphasize that multiplayer peer is a facade pattern, meaning it just looks like a peer when you're using it. Everything else, like whether it is uh, running through Steam or Enet or whatever you want, is hidden from the surface because you shouldn't have to worry about that. What makes that especially great is it is swappable, which is what we will be doing with our example uh, Watered Down Bomberman game. You will be able to choose between Enet and Steamworks. The Enet process uses sockets. That's an IP address and a port number together to identify players. The IP address tells you which machine it is and how to locate it. The port is kind of a bridge between software on that machine and the internet. I'm not going to go into the details of what they are here. 
but you will need their IP address from your machine and the correct port number in order to hook up. It can create a server on an arbitrary port locally. It's pretty much just one function, really, and assigning things. And it can also connect on the same port to a server as a client. It's an excellent basis for testing multiplayer peer connections. Here's an example of how to create a host with eNet taken from our program. Create eNet host, taking a little bit of utility information, in this case the player name. That's not really necessary, so don't worry about that if you're just worried about understanding how to create a peer. The first thing we do is set our peer, which is a superclass here. It's a multiplayer peer, to an eNet multiplayer peer. Then we call create server with default port. I believe this is currently set to 10567. It can be anything. You just want to make sure there's no other program on your machine that's using the same port so they don't confuse each other. After that, we do a little bit of housekeeping work. And then finally, and this is an important part, we call multiplayer.set multiplayer peer to this peer. So it knows that it is the one that we are using. You can have multiple active peers at the same time, but you can only use one. Once we have that host, we would want to connect as a client. Create eNet client takes the same housekeeping information, which you don't really need to worry about, and an address as a string in this case. First thing you do is create the multiplayer peer as enet, of course. I, in my program, I generally reset it to null afterwards, just so that we start from the beginning. Then we call create client, which takes the address and the same default port. It will attempt to connect there. If there is no server there, then connecting to the server is going to fail. But after you've set your multiplayer peer, and again, that's quite important, you can await connecting to the server with await multiplayer.connected to server. This is going to be emitted whenever the connection succeeds and we know that we are talking to another program on the other end. Some people also like to wait a second or two there, thinking it'll be enough time, but truthfully, you don't know that. Uh, there might be a line down somewhere or network errors. It's easier to just wait for connected to server. It's what I encourage. The Steam multiplayer peer process, once you have Steam, Godot Steam working, is quite similar. But rather than full sockets, it uses Steam IDs and allows the Steam client to figure that out. You will need to have the Steam client running in order to use it. And Steam IDs, since they are fairly arbitrary, I couldn't tell you what mine is as, as an example, uh, they can be obtained using the Steamworks lobby system, which we will also be going into as it's practically essential for getting multiplayer going on Steam, and it's quite useful. Lobbies are a way for players around the world in arbitrary places to find each other and form an optimal connection. Uh, there are many different features in the Steamworks API for organizing them. You could go, say, by proximity, as an example. And they are primarily managed by the Steam server. So as an example of how you would create a host in Steam instead of Enet, you start by defining your peer as, of course, Steam Multiplayer Peer .new. And this is from the Steam Multiplayer Peer package. You call create host there. Now there are two fields for create host. Usually it's zero in an empty array. Zero is for virtual ports, which most of us aren't really worried about. And the empty array is a list of potential options. These are covered in the Steamworks documentation from Valve. Most of the time zero in an empty array will do just fine for you. And then we remember to set our multiplayer peer that we are using to the one we just set up. This is what multiplayer synchronizers and spawners and the like will all be looking at. To create a client, you do something very similar. 
But remember I mentioned that Steam Multiplayer Peer uses a Steam ID and lets the client find the socket. So that is what we are passing in here. Connect the Steam socket to this Steam ID, which we are passing in. The rest of it will be handled under the hood, which is great. And then lastly, remember to set your multiplayer peer. Our example program is going to be a modernized example from Godot 2. I really like the principles of it, but I didn't care for its coding standards in the modern day. It's a watered-down version of Bomberman. Uh, not all the features are in there. You won't have bombs sitting off other bombs or anything. But it demonstrates both ENET multiplayer peer, the way I have it set up, and alternatively, Steam multiplayer peer, along with their swappability. So you should at this point have identical functionality between ENET and Steam. The rest of the game does not care how you connected so much as that you connected. Code has been mostly modernized with anonymous lambda functions in places where you need a callback, but you don't want it to be a true function because nothing else should ever be calling it. That's a great time for that. Uh, I've updated a lot of the naming conventions to something I feel is a little bit more readable. Truthfully, when you're writing a program, you're not just writing for your computer, you're writing for the next person reading it, which is why we have linting and coding standards.